Thanks very much, Mark. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you here this afternoon to add my welcome to Mark's and to introduce Archie to you. Uh, I want to say at the outset, before I forget, because Liesl has told me to, and I always do what Liesl tells me, is that Archie is with us for a couple of months in the Graduate School of Library and Information Science, and if uh, any of you would like to get in touch with him there, then it's very easy uh, to do so, and he's, very, he will be, he's indicated he'll be very happy to talk to people if, if they wish to. I first met Archie uh, only recently at a seminar called Libraries in Times of War, Revolution and Social Change, which was held at Allerton Park last October. Archie was one of the stars of that seminar. Uh, he gave a fascinating paper, and he participated in, this, in the proceedings of the seminar with a quiet, good-humored uh, dignity and intelligence that won general admiration. Al Kagan from the University Library, who has been essentially the co-sponsor of Archie's visit, and I then checked Archie out. Well, Al knew something about uh, Archie uh, already, of course, from his connection with uh, African studies. What we found led my colleagues and I in the Graduate School of Library and Information Science and Al and his colleagues in the library and the Center for African Studies to seek to bring Archie to the University of Illinois as a Miller Endowment Committee visiting professor and as a visiting scholar in our school, the Graduate School of Library and Information Science. And I acknowledge here with gratitude the support that we have had from the Miller Committee, from the school, from the library, and from the Center for African Studies. Now, a little bit about what I found when I checked Archie out. Archie entered the Cape Town City Library at the age of 17, rapidly rising through the ranks to become a senior librarian. While employed in the library, he took his basic professional degree in librarianship. He then came to this country. He went to the University of Washington in 1981 for his master's degree. And then he returned to South Africa to a junior lectureship in the University of the Western Cape. And he completed his PhD in the University of Cape Town in 1991. Predictably, from those who now, now knowing him, his academic career has been somewhat breakneck in speed. Uh, he became the equivalent of associate professor in, in our system, associate professor, in the University of Western Cape, was recruited to the University of South Africa, where he became professor, head of his school, then deputy dean of the faculty. We've shared our feelings uh, about these administrative posts, which, unless one has a certain kind of hard, perhaps ruthless ambition, can divert one from the roles of teacher and researcher that bring most of us into the university in the first place. And fortunately for us and for the profession in 2003, Archie's stint of university administrative duties was done. He was recruited to the University of Pretoria as a full professor, and he now concentrates on teaching and research. He's been very active professionally, both in the library and information science community in South Africa and internationally. Uh, he's a member of a number of editorial boards, including that of the Library Quarterly, a University of Chicago press journal that I once had the honor of editing for a number of years, and of various committees, boards, and so on, as you would expect of somebody of his prominence. He has witnessed the rapid transformation of librarianship as it has assimilated or been assimilated by what we call information science, and he has reflected deeply on the nature of the changes that have been occasioned by the advent of information technology and the rise of the digital era. His important 2002 book, Philosophy, Politics and Economics of Information, derived from these studies. And he has continued to write articles with titles like Social Epistemology, Information Science and Ideology. But as important as this work is, it is his historical writing and research that most captured my imagination and that I think will most interest you as a general audience. Envision, if you will, that extraordinary colonial world that was part of that empire on which it was claimed so erroneously when I was a boy that the sun never sets. A world that was transformed eventually into the internationally shunned apartheid regime of the Republic of South Africa, 
and that witnessed a struggle for freedom and true democracy that has given us such towering figures as Nelson Man uh, Mandela and Desmond Tutu, and an idea of social, cultural, and political reconciliation that is surely, alas, all too unique in our ethnically divided world. Archie's historical research is focused on the role of books, reading, and libraries in his nation's extraordinary social and political journey. His research within this frame is nevertheless wide-ranging, though it has a fine cohesiveness to it. Let me read some of the titles of his recent papers just to give you a flavor and to set the scene for his talk today. Book history, library history, and South Africa's reading culture. To make the people of South Africa proud of their membership of the great British Empire. That's a quote. Home reading unions in South Africa, 1900 to 1914. Building a nation of readers, question mark. Women's organizations and the politics of reading in South Africa, 1910, 1914. Send your books on active service. The books for the troop scheme during the Second World War, 1939 to 45. Book Burning and the Complicity of South African Librarians, 1955 to 1971. And then for our seminar uh, last October, the books were just props, public libraries and contested spaces in the Cape Townships in the 1980s. Another paper, South Africa's Information Industry and Mbeki's African Renaissance. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me Great pleasure to introduce Professor Archie Dick and to invite him as a Miller Committee visiting professor in our great university to address us on librarians and readers in the South African anti-apartheid struggle. Archie Dick. Thank you, Boyd, for those kind words. Uh, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, I wish to thank the members of the Miller Committee for inviting me to share some of my work uh, with you today. I appreciate your interest and this opportunity. I wish to thank uh, especially Professor John Unsworth of the Graduate School of Library and Information Science at this university, and Professor Boyd Rayward, um, who we've just heard, uh, as well as Professor Al Kagan uh, from the University Library for making my visit possible. I worked in a number of Cape Town's township libraries during the South African anti-apartheid struggle. In the 1970s, many of them were substandard and were housed in unsuitable buildings, like the one in Hanover Park that was a disused house and a gang hideout. It was certainly unsafe for children and librarians alike. More importantly though, the complexities, subtleties, and nuances of the anti-apartheid struggle itself continue to interest me. These features characterized also the personal struggles of ordinary South Africans, like librarians and readers who resisted apartheid in Cape Town's strife-torn communities and in prisons during the turbulent 1980s. Their stories are at risk of being forgotten. Take the story of the librarian Muhammad Dolly. I worked with Muhammad in a public library in the early 1980s, but I learned only recently that he had been an, an operative for MK, or Umkonte Wesizwe, the armed wing of the African National Congress. He was a political intelligence recruiter, and the library was often used for clandestine meetings. More interesting to me is Muhammad's political background. His uncle was Reggie September, a prominent ANC leader who was hounded by the security police. His grandfather, Sali Dolly, helped Reggie escape from South Africa and from the clutches of the apartheid regime in 1963. But in 1984, Sali Dolly, 
became a member of PW Bhutta's tricameral parliament that included coloreds, Indians, and whites, and that excluded blacks. And Muhammad Dali, the librarian, started working for the ANC spy network. Or take the story of Neville Alexander. Neville was sentenced to imprisonment on Robben Island from 1964 to 1974 after being charged and convicted of conspiracy to commit sabotage as a member of the Yu Chi Chan Club and the National Liberation Front. He was a brilliant scholar and a prolific reader who fought constantly with prison censors. But the censors were not very sharp and many subversive books of economic and political theory with fairly innocuous titles were let in unknowingly. Neville admits that as a result of this, he read books in prison that he would never have had the time or the chance to read outside. He read classics of European literature, Gibbon, Shakespeare, Dickens, African history, international law, economics, languages, and lots of German literature. And he adds, I quote, I had more banned books inside prison than I ever had outside, end of quote. Muhammad Dali and Neville Alexander's stories may be somewhat special, but surprises, unusual alliances, and cameos of personal courage, even heroism, were not uncommon in the anti-apartheid struggle. Across South Africa's townships, professions, social classes, and other well-known divides. My focus is on librarians and readers because they are usually perceived as timid, retiring, and politically inconspicuous. These stories how, show, however, how ordinary South Africans stood up to an authoritarian and racist regime. This talk is part of an ongoing project that connects with what may be loosely called a social history of libraries and reading in South Africa. By this, I simply mean that the focus is on the everyday experiences and practices of rank and file librarians instead of the high level profiling of famous library directors and prestigious libraries. And it is especially during times of conflict and radical social change that the professional values of librarians and the social structures of their professional associations can be more readily examined. This is because what are normally latent and unquestioned assumptions are then stretched, as the historian Eric Hobsbawm says, to breaking point, thus laying them bare for detailed analysis. Another theme that runs through this project concerns locating libraries in a wider set of social institutions that either promote or block the flow of ideas in societies. Perhaps in this way it connects libraries with issues of intellectual freedom. The anti-apartheid struggle was also a struggle of ideas. Ideas about equality, segregation, nonviolence and the armed struggle, capitalism and socialism, boycotts and sanctions busting, liberation before education versus education for liberation, and so forth. Some librarians helped to circulate and diffuse these ideas, both inside and outside of libraries. Debates, discussions, and public performance in the space of the library recognized the township's oral traditions and their low, uh, low literacy rates. And some readers invested their reading with a community and activist spirit that extended beyond normal reading behavior as an isolated and private activity. Reading aloud in a group was one example of this. Luke Smart and Goodley was a literate young man from the Eastern Cape. At probably South Africa's first MK camp at Marmaray, just outside of Cape Town, in 1962, he read aloud to new recruits from Jean-Paul Sartre's short story, The Wall and from Che Guevara's writings. These readings were followed by discussion to inspire the recruits and to teach them about the worldwide struggle against oppression. Sadly, Luke Smart died in detention in 1963. Reading selectively was another example. Cecil Esau, who is now a member of the Institute for Justice and Reconciliation in South Africa, was once a student leader and a member of the Alsace River Public Library. 
He tells how members of his activist reading circle used that library's so-called safe anti-communist books to actually learn more about communism. They did so by concentrating solely on the quotations taken from communist sources that were found in these books and that were singled out by the authors for ridicule. Reading cryptically was a further example. The overwhelming need to maintain contact with the outside world drove political prisoner Ruth First, wife of the late Joe Slovo, to hoist herself up to the sol solitary confinement cell window and crane her neck to read whatever letters that she could make out on news posters wrapped around electric lampposts outside the Marshall Square police station in Johannesburg. From these isolated letters, she pieced together the daily headlines and called this, and I quote, reading my daily newspaper, end of quote. Ruth was killed by a letter bomb in 1982. Reading critically was still another example. Political prisoners on Robben Island read government propaganda magazines like the South African panorama Fiat Lux, or Let There Be Light, from the Indian Affairs Department, and Alpha from the Coloured Affairs Department, by simply standing the news on its head. If an article argued that Bantu education was being widely accepted, they concluded that it was in fact being roundly resisted. More astutely, one political prisoner read in the business section of a smuggled newspaper about the huge financial losses of a subsidiary company of the state-owned Sassel Corporation. He inferred from this that rumors of a successful armed attack on this oil refinery plant were in fact true. That night, political prisoners on Robben Island celebrated with mugs of coffee. These reading strate strategies recalled a Cape Library tradition that had emerged in the 1930s and 1940s when self-made intellectuals and book collectors like James Leguma, Johnny Gomez, Sissi Gull, and Christian Zierhochel introduced young men and women from the townships to books and music at social events. Many political factions like the Lenin Club, the Spartacus Club, the New Era of Fellowship, and several other Trotskyist groups had taught reading and writing and distributed the books of the Left Book Club. A central idea in this Cape Library tradition was that the books were just the props and implied that debate and discussion of South Africa's political and cultural conditions were of primary concern for especially young people. At the Hyman Liberman Institute in District 6, where Christian Zierfuchel was the librarian in the 1930s, progressive intellectuals would come to the library not to look for books, but to look for an argument. And Zierfuchel would invite members of the Lenin Club to debate the colored nationalists and so forth. This Cape Library tradition operated both inside and outside of the library itself, and sometimes involved the production of reading matter. Robert Krieger tells how Paulo Freire's Pedagogy of the Oppressed was translated and typed in Afrikaans on a battered old typewriter and circulated secretly to activist reading circles in the 1980s. The typewriter, fruitlessly sought by security police as evidence to lay charges, still lies buried today under a palm tree on Moravian Hill, the site of a bed and breakfast motel in Cape Town. The librarian Vincent Carby grew up in the Cape Library tradition and used the library in Bontierville and Kensington townships as a marketplace for ideas and opinions in the 1980s. The library was a contested but shared space so that young people debated and discussed alternative strategies at meetings held in the library. These meetings were usually held under the guise of the chess club, the dove club, or the cultural society. A young Trevor Manuel, who is South Africa's Minister of Finance today, was a member of one such reading group at Kensington Public Library. There is a rumor circulating that he still has overdue fines outstanding there. <laughs> Banned books and trade union materials fed 
and fueled these discussions. They were often supplied by a few brave librarians and activists. South Africa's censorship laws had become quite bizarre by the 1970s and 1980s when titles like Black Beauty, a children's book, was banned. French writer Stendhal's The Red and the Black combined the two most subversive colors in South African officialdom's eyes and was also banned. Joe Slovo lost three books, uh, three copies of this book in as many raids. The government's banned lists, which eventually grew to include thousands of items, included John Steinbeck's novel, Grapes of Wrath, Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech, and the movie that showed Bing Crosby and Louis Armstrong singing together. The South African Library Association initially folded its hands as thousands of banned books were burned weekly at government incinerators and furnaces around the country. Even the book Fahrenheit 451 by Ray Bradbury, which is a book about book burning, was burned. The strongest protest that the group of young liberal librarians could muster at the time was to insist that the government's banned lists be published, I quote, in accepted bibliographical style, end of quote, which really amounts to saying, if we're going to burn books, then for goodness sake, let's at least do so in alphabetical order. But during that time, a few brave librarians risked arrest and police harassment in order to supply readers with banned material. Vincent Colby used an inconspicuous sports bag under a library desk to hide materials that activists would use discreetly. During police raids, of course, no one knew whose bag it was. The librarian, John Jacobs, hid banned materials in holes dug in his backyard. Unequal library services resulted from racial discrimination that sometimes assumed an Orwellian-style manipulation of rules by white librarians. Senior staff of the Cape Town City Library Service, for example, tampered with the South African library standards so that the official stipulation to allocate library funds per head of population was qualified by the phrase, and I quote, except in areas of known illiteracy, end of quote. This ensured smaller book supplies for libraries in areas racially designated for blacks and coloreds. The library space, like any lived space, was one of continual meaning-making and conflict among various groups. It was constantly made and unmade, claimed and disclaimed by communities. The reason was that the anti-apartheid struggle was not fought by a happy band of brothers and sisters, and the library was often drawn into bitter conflicts. At schools where the United Front view of liberation before education held sway, teachers combined classroom academic work with becoming informed about changes that were happening in the country. These activists participated in demonstrations and marches and were often the victims of police brutality, detention, and torture. For them, the local public library became the space to meet and use for planning awareness programs and political strategy and organizing protest marches. At schools where a new unity movement and Teachers League of South Africa view of education for liberation prevailed, learners were encouraged to stay in classes. They were taught that protest marches and demonstrations were quick fixes that would not work and that they should not lose the, the momentum of their studies. Learners were provided with study guides that they used at school. But some unity movement teachers also gathered at libraries with school learners to discuss political topics and leadership and how to conduct themselves in a revolutionary situation. In Bishop Lavers and Hanover Park townships, librarian John Jacobs accommodated such rival political groups. The Bishop Lavers Action Committee, which was aligned with the Cape Action League, League and the Unity Movement, used the Bishop Lavers Public Library regularly for meetings, for exchanging materials, and for producing newsletters. The Hanover Park Library Hall 
was used by a youth cell of the Pan-Africanist Congress-aligned Muslim strand, a political strand called Qibla, which met under the leadership of the activist Ahmed Qasim. Qibla drew on an uncompromisingly revolutionary interpretation of the Quran and opposed the UDF's strategy. Access to reading material in prison was difficult, especially in the 1960s and 1970s. And it was only through successful legal applications for access to reading materials and through anti-censorship struggles that matters improved slowly uh, by the 1980s. The conditions of the 90-day 90 90 detention only allowed prisoners the Bible or holy books of other religions. But in 1964, Albie Sachs, a justice of South Africa's constitutional court today, won the right of access to books while he was held in solitary confinement. That decision was, however, soon reversed. And in 1977, Rivonia trialist Dennis Goldberg led a group at Pretoria Central Prison that took the Minister of Prisons to court to fight the censorship of magazines. They won the case, and there was no censorship until he left prison in 1985. And then it started again. So the right of access was withdrawn from time to time, often without explanation, and prison censorship was erratic. Even when university books were allowed in for studies, the prison censor could hold back a suspicious title so that the prisoner would often receive notices of overdue fines for the book before getting the book itself. There were occasions when Pan-Africanist Congress and African National Congress members shared newspapers and cooperated with each other through the library. At the end of 1965, when the library in the general section of Robben Island became operational, it was organized and run by Pan-Africanist Congress members Stanley Mokoba, Kanzibe Rosebury Ngriki, and Dikang Moseneke, who is a high court judge today. Ngriki used his freedom as librarian to move from cell to cell in order to spread the word of an impending 100-hour hunger strike that involved all the other political prisoners. Klaus Mashishi and Sadiq Isaac later continued the work of this library. Ravonia trialist and prisoner Ahmed Kathrada ran the tiny library for the segregated senior political prisoners that included Nelson Mandela. Kathrada's library assistants were Kayla Shubane and Zbu Ndebele, who is the premier of KwaZulu province today. Kathrada also used his position as librarian to communicate information and have discussions with general section political prisoners when he delivered, collected, and took stock of library books annually. The prisoners therefore shared a kind of democracy of books and reading. Many of these prisoner librarians subsequently earned qualifications in librarianship from the Correspondence University of South Africa, and they improved library services to other political prisoners. Until then, library services in the hands of the prison warders had been quite hilarious, albeit frustrating for some readers. At Pretoria Central Prison, for example, very little could be traced in Chief Warder Dupree's catalog of purchased books because most books were filed under T, since so many titles started with a definite article, the, which any respectable librarian knows is not a filing element. The catalog also listed Shakespeare's The Tempest as science fiction, and Romeo and Juliet appeared as author anonymous. On one occasion, when Hugh Lewin was given a book by Edwin Spender instead of the poet Stephen Spender, as he had requested, he was asked by a prison hoarder if Edwin Spender would not do, since it was still Spender after all. An unusual kind of cooperation between political prisoners and prison wardens sometimes facilitated reading and improved library matters. For example, a prison warder smuggled westerns to James Cantor on a number of occasions, and the station commander at Maitland Police Station offered Albisax one of his family's library cards to save him the money that he spent on buying books, and the police constable collected his books for him 
from the local library. Nelson Mandela once placed the Heisgenoot, an Afrikaans language magazine, in a conspicuous position for a board warder to notice on his rounds. After passing the cell a few times, the warder asked to borrow it. Mandela obliged, but asked that his lights be left on to study and read throughout the night. And at Polsma Prison, Ahmed Kathrada secured permission to order a complete set of the Encyclopedia Britannica for the library with the assistance of censor officer James Gregory, whose book, uh, Goodbye Bafana, I believe has been turned into a movie and I think has just been screened at the Berlin Film Festival. Women distinguished themselves both as librarians and as readers in the struggle. When state prosecutors in Quentin Jacobson's trial tried to show links between his political activities and the contents of banned books seized during his arrest, Ms. Ogilvie, an unassuming assistant city librarian of the Johannesburg Public Library, read out in court a list of the library titles similar to those found in his possession. The charge of obtaining information that could be used to further the aims of communism was subsequently dismissed because the information could easily be found in the reference section of Ms. Ogilvie's public library. This also left Jacobson wondering why he had gone to such trouble for his books when he could just have gone to his local library. But many activists had done just that. Ben Turok mentions that when the ANC turned to the armed struggle in the early 1960s, some of the members scoured the shelves of public libraries for insights into how secret undercover action and organization might be developed. Harold Strachan went even further when he consulted the Encyclopedia Britannica and other books in the Port Elizabeth Public Library to update his World War II experience with explosives. Female political prisoners were more likely to be separated and isolated from each other than males. Fatima Mir, for example, was kept by herself at the fort in Johannesburg where lights went out at 8 o'clock. Her son, Rashid, was, however, held together with other male detainees at Modrabi Prison in Benoni, where they had a good selection of books and could read throughout the night. Fatima had to fight prison authorities initially to get the books that she wanted. For other black women, matters were just as bad and sometimes worse. Feziwe Bukolani's Bible was confiscated during solitary confinement at Clarksdorp Prison. Instead, she played Scrabble with little pieces of toilet paper to prevent losing her mind. And at John Forster Square, Emma Maschinini was also refused the Bible by prison authorities on the grounds that she was a communist and the usual sarcastic comment that they did not want to get her expelled from the party. More tragically, Colleen Williams, a Bonteville Library member and a member of the Bonteville military wing, died during the unrest. Political prisoners with life or long sentences had to press a whole lot of living out of the books they read. Antonio Gramsci, who was himself imprisoned by Mussolini in the 1920s and 1930s, explained this as squeezing blood from stones. Books in this way were sometimes used in intriguing ways. Tim Jenkin used Henri Charrier's Papillon, a story about a prison breakout, to inspire the successful escape from Pretoria Central Prison with two fellow political prisoners on 11 December 1979. He says that this book taught him a number of valuable lessons that guided his thinking and actions. And a good book was often one that could be smoked better than others. Usually, this was in fact the good book, since the thin leaves of the Bible were especially sought after as smoking paper. When they received two packets of boxer tobacco and flint from a warder at Leucorp Prison, Indres Naidu and fellow detainees used pages of the Gideon Bible and shavings from a war-issued toothbrush to make six long zoles or hand-rolled cigarettes. For the next three to four glorious days, 
nigh Douglots, the Bible became slimmer and slimmer, providing less and less reading matter for one of his religious comrades. Defense attorneys often insisted that awaiting trial prisoners read light material before their court appearances. But some prisoners were earnest about reading. On Robben Island, there was a reading and literature society, and political prisoners used library books to organize discussions and to adapt and stage plays. The works of Defoe, Swift, Eliot, Austin, Balzac, Gorky, Shakespeare, Stendhal, Zola, Fielding, James, and Dickens were widely read. Some prisoners had special preferences. Steve Biko, for example, read only fiction while he was in jail. Others wanted longer novels and considered anything less than 500 pages as a short story. Nelson Mandela read and reread Tolstoy's War and Peace several times and identified with General Kutuzov, who made decisions based on, and I quote, a visceral understanding of his men and his people, end of quote. Alby Sachs enjoyed Don Quixote, Thomas Mann's Buddenbrook's Irving Stone's The Agony and the Ecstasy, and James Missioner's Hawaii. He also wanted to read books alive with people instead of books of philosophy or politics or criticism. Ashley Creel, uh, I just have a picture here of Nelson Mandela's bookshelf. Um, Nelson Mandela also read a course of books in gardening uh, and became a well-known gardener on Robben Island, but those tomatoes there, I found out, were not his. Uh, those were from another prisoner. Ashley Creel, the Bonteville UDF activist who was killed by security forces in 1987, borrowed The Children of Shea from the prominent communist leader Jeremy Cronin. He subsequently copied Shea Guevara's dress style, as you will notice. There was therefore a wide range of reading tastes among political prisoners and activists. Many prisoners only became literate in prison and then became avid readers. And librarians sought to supply them with suitable materials. Even in exile, in Tanzania, librarian Steve Bodibe started out with the most basic equipment and materials to support the academic and political education of young students and activists. This collection did, however, grow to become part of a modern, fit-for-purpose educational library of the Solomon Mashlango Freedom College in Tanzania with international financial support. In conclusion, I recently heard an outspoken critic of the present government acknowledge that if W. de Klerk and Rolf Mayer were no match for the giant intellects of Nelson Mandela and Cyril Ramaphosa during the historic negotiations in the early 1990s. But behind Mandela and his comrades stood the librarians Ahmed Katrada, Stanley Mokhoba, Siddiq Isaacs, and others, and behind many activists and ordinary readers who fought the apartheid regime in the townships in their own small ways, there were some extraordinary librarians supplying and sifting materials. Their roles in the South African anti-apartheid struggle remind librarians everywhere of the intellectual and cultural politics that is also librarianship. Thank you. I'll be happy to take any questions that you may have or any comments, any things you would like to add to what I've said at this point. Yes, ma'am. Um, this was very much during the period of 1955 to 1971 when books were actually being banned. Um, the responses were varied. Um, some librarians um, 
took the view that they were not going to cooperate with um, directives coming from uh, the head offices. Uh, I know, for example, with the, in the case of the National Library, um, um, I forget his name now, said that he's simply not going to remove books um, from his shelves and return them anyway, because um, in that case, fortunately, the, that was not a circulating library. But in other cases, I know that um, librarians were fairly much uh, compelled to withdraw books from circulation, to then withdraw the catalog cards, to put them in the books and send them back to the head office. And there they were prepared for pulping or for burning. Uh, pulping became an option uh, after librarians decided that it, uh, it, was a, it was a way of earning money instead of just burning them and losing the books. Or if the books, um, uh, I think another option was to put them one side uh, and, and perhaps uh, once the book is unbanned, they could use it again. The, the South African Library Association, by and large, was, was apathetic and indifferent. I've looked through the literature, uh, the newsletters of the association, and the official journal, and there was very little mention made, nothing about book burning at all, uh, and very little uh, mention made about um, censorship as such. So um, co commentary at that time, uh, contemporary commentary, was that the, the um, South African Library Association was fairly much uh, supporting by their silence what was happening around the country. Um, I must um, admit at the same time that by the 1970s and early 1980s, uh, the South African Library Association, Association did start up uh, a special committee that then submitted lists of these banned books uh, to the government and, and many uh, books were then unbanned, many of these titles. Yes, boy. Well, uh, by the 1970s, um, libraries were segregated. Uh, and this was as a result of a number of laws that were promulgated in, in the 50s already, um, but only began to take effect in the 60s and 70s, like the Group Areas Act, um, uh, where uh, you know, certain uh, areas were set aside for certain racial groups. But um, there was a time when it was like a, a, a period uh, when people who had originally lived with whites in certain areas like, let's say, Observatory or Mowbray, and were all of them ratepayers and insisted on using the library, um, there was the most cynical use being made at that point of um, mobile libraries, where um, the, the mobile library was introduced into the city library services, and it was the, the, the mobile truck, for example, stopped just about 100 meters away from the actual library, and the mobile library was used for, at that point, colored users, because they were not allowed to use the, the, the white library, which, which became the white library then, um, but uh, they had not moved out of the area yet. You know, so um, by the 1970s, it was fairly segregated by the time I grew up and used libraries in Cape Town. Yes, there were, there were many libraries in, in Cape Town. Uh, you must remember Cape Town had a fairly liberal tradition. And um, uh, so that, for example, even by the 1960s, uh, 50s and 60s, you still had people uh, you know, who were in prominent positions in ratepayers associations and so forth. Um, and uh, they fought you know, against segregation. Uh, but when the provincial ordinance, uh, of which Cape Town became, uh, of course, his part, uh, was introduced, it was introduced um, on the condition, in other words, free library services was introduced on the condition that it would be segregated. Uh, but many individual libraries held out for as long as they could because people who were still living around Cape Town uh, and who were members in these libraries for many years continued to use their libraries. And librarians in those libraries um, you know, just turned a blind eye and allowed them to use these libraries until word got back to head office and, you know, these things began to become known. Um, uh, librarians were then compelled, you know, to enforce the law. So there was a period when there was, I suppose, a gray period before it was actually entrenched. Yes. If there are no other comments or questions, I, I think I'll turn it back to, uh, to Boyd.
at this point. I have one more question. Oh, of course. Yeah. 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 Um, what has happened to the Library Association? I think from things I've read of yours that there has been uh, a major change that the old Library Association, um, has, correct me if I'm wrong, I think it came moribund and there is now a new approach to joining the groups together who are concerned with yes. the information science. Yes. The, um, the Library Association today is called the Library and Information Association of South Africa, the acronym LIHASA. Uh, this year it celebrates its 10th year. Um, it, uh, you know, attempted um, more, just over 10 years ago to bring all the uh, different library associations together. It did not work uh, very well uh, so that one library association felt alienated uh, and its members, unfortunately, um, have not really joined the new library association in, in numbers, uh, which I think is really unfortunate. Um, the situation was, uh, the way I analyze it, uh, like what was happening um, in the broader uh, picture in South Africa, where the, the two largest uh, political parties, the National Party and the, uh, of course, the, uh, not the party, but then the African National Congress, uh, sat down with smaller parties and use the principle of reasonable consensus so that if a difficult matter came up, you know, if really if the National Party and the uh, uh, ANC agreed on it, it really didn't matter too much what the others were saying. And in this case, the, the, the old association, the South African Library Association, which had changed its name to South African Institute of Library Information Science, SALIS, but when they said uh, something was okay and the old African Library Association of South Africa, ALASA, said it's okay. They kind of, you know, um, went along with, with, with that as a, as a reasonable consensus. Um, so we do have um, one uh, um, uh, association right now because uh, the other one, which was called LIWO, the Library and Information Workers Organization, uh, sadly uh, disbanded uh, recently. Um, so uh, there are efforts, though, to try and bring them back into the fold so that we can become a strong library association. And this year, uh, we will be having um, uh, the IFLA, the International Federation of Library Associations, will have the World Congress in Durban in South Africa. So I hope that will be a good uh, indication of things to come. Thanks, Ken. Um, well, uh, unfortunately, it, uh, my own perspective is that um, with the changes in the country around um, 1990s, early 1990s um, to mid-1990s, there was a lot of uh, throwing out the baby with the bathwater. Um, there was um, a lot of skilled and experienced people that got lost and alienated and estranged uh, along the way. And now when I look at the Library Association of South Africa, of which I'm a member, um, I see them trying to, to start up things again, which were going quite well um, in the early 1990s. Um, uh, one of the, the things that I think needs to be done uh, is, and I unfortunately have to refer to myself here, I've been trying to get going inside the Library Association, for example, is a Freedom of Access to Information and Freedom of Expression Committee. Um, and we're hoping that well, that will be an opportunity to uh, address social issues, issues around um, uh, class matters, which is still, a, as you know, uh, a big problem in South Africa. Um, and uh, we hope that, uh, my hope is that people from LIWO, for example, uh, who have so much experience 
um, uh, can come on board again and bring their expertise and, and address these, these questions. At the moment, uh, it's fairly much uh, bread and butter issues. That's, that's uh, you know, things like membership and, and, and so on, and running the annual conferences, it seems to me, and the big events like um, International Book Day and, and so on which occupy their interests. But it's going to be a long, hard slog to get these little com subcommittees going again and to get the people back into uh, the association who can do it. Um, but it, I think it's going to be a public relations exercise uh, in many respects.